located at the Westin Grand Cayman, Seven Mile Beach Resort and Spa. If it matters to you, it matters to us. We're Cayman 27, Cayman Informed. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the First Baptist Church. My name is Paul Biles, and I'm the President-Elect of the Chamber, and I'll be asking the questions this evening. The Chamber of Commerce has been holding candidate forums every election year since the 1980s as a way to enable voters to meet their candidates. All of the candidates for the 2017 election received invitations to attend their forum and to answer our questions. And we would like to thank tonight's Georgetown East candidates for attending. This year, with the implementation of the one person, one vote system, it is more important than ever that voters inform themselves. The voting constituencies have also been subject to change with 19 electoral constituencies now identified. On Wednesday, May 10th, voter registration cards will be available for collection from Georgetown Hospital from 9.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Voters will require a valid form of photo ID to collect the voter cards. Voting locations have been uploaded to our elections page on caymanchamber.ky. I'd like to thank the Chamber staff for their assistance in organizing these forums, as well as Hurley's Media for broadcasting the forums live on Cayman 27 and online. Special thanks to our corporate sponsors for their support, including the DART organization, Deloitte, Foster's IGA, Heritage Holdings, and Puritan Cleaners. Mr. Will Panu, our Chief Executive Officer of the Chamber, will be tonight's moderator. He will explain the rules of the forum and he will then introduce tonight's candidates. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, candidates. I'll just go over the rules for the tonight's forum. Each candidate will be asked a series of questions and you'll have two minutes to respond to the question if you choose to do so. If you hear this ring, that means you have 30 seconds left in the response time. And when you reach the conclusion of that 30 seconds, I'll allow you to wrap up your thoughts, so don't rush. You'll have a little few, few seconds remaining. So I'll ask each candidate to stick to the issues. We're asking you not to, to get, take any personal attacks against another candidate. And we're asking you at the conclusion of question times to deliver a two minute closing statement. And again, um, once you get to the two minutes, um, you'll have a chance to wind up your thought. Don't want you to rush. We have to take a deep breath, we'll be fine. So when we return from this short break, I'll introduce this evening's candidates for Georgetown East. Please stay tuned. You're right. I mean, if Jennifer asked for something really disturbing for her birthday deal, I, I don't know how I'll handle it. My guess is not well. <laughs> hey, maybe I'm worried about nothing. I mean, what's the worst she can ask for? Props, you in a cheerleader outfit, a third party involved, not necessarily a lady. <laughs> The world is getting smaller. We travel more. We see more. We do more. So you need a bigger health plan, like Premier Health. You have easy access to benefits at home. One million U.S. providers accept your ID card for college, vacation, and business travel. With 24-7 worldwide assistance, U.S. pharmacy benefits, and 96% of claims settled in five days, Premier Health offers you the care you deserve. Brit K, where people come first. BritK.ky have you had your Tortuga moment today? Come by Tortuga Fine Wine and Spirits for all your liquor needs and taste the world famous Tortuga rum and rum cake. Baked fresh daily in the Cayman Islands. Enchanting, exotic and always delicious. 
like the moments you share and will savor forever. The taste of the Cayman Islands, remembering the time of your life over and over again. Such sweet surrender. Welcome back to the First Baptist Church where we have four Georgetown East candidates this evening for the forum. Now it gives me pleasure to introduce each of the candidates. I'll introduce them as they're seated this evening. We'll begin with Sharon Rolston. She's been, practicing she's been a practicing attorney for over 20 years, having earned her LLB with honors from the University of Liverpool. Ms. Rolston has chaired numerous government statutory boards, including the Civil Service Appeals Commission, Seneco, and the Immigration and Work Permit Boards. She's a founding member of the YMCA and serves on its Programs Development Committee. She was awarded the Queen's Certificate and Badge of Honor for her services to the Cayman Islands community. Ms. Rolston is seeking election as an independent candidate for Georgetown. Welcome. Thank you. Teresa Bodden is a businesswoman who has born and was born and raised in Georgetown. After completing her studies at Reading University in the United Kingdom, Ms. Bodden returned to the Cayman Islands to take up employment in the media industry working as a journalist. She has served on numerous government boards and worked alongside numerous community organizations, and she was awarded the Queen's Certificate and Badge of Honor for her services to the community. Ms. Bodden is seeking election as a Cayman Democratic Party candidate for Georgetown East. Thank you. Welcome. Roy McTaggart is currently the second elected member for Georgetown, and he's serving as a counselor in various ministries, including finance and economic development, financial services, commerce and environment, Ministry of Health and Culture, and the Ministry of Home Affairs. Mr. McTaggart served in the financial industry with KPMG for nearly 30 years and served as managing partner for nine of those years. Mr. McTaggart is seeking re-election as a progressives candidate for Georgetown East. Welcome, Roy. Thank you. Mr. Kenrick Webster served with the Royal Cayman Islands Police Service for 10 years. In 1994, he retired from police service to manage Webster's Tours, a business which he established in 1990. Mr. Webster has served on numerous boards, including as a director for transportation for the Cayman Islands Tourism Association and as a member of the Public Transportation Board, to name but a few. Mr. Webster is seeking election as an independent candidate for Georgetown East. Welcome. Thank you. I now turn it over to Mr. Biles to begin the questioning. Thank you, Will. We'll start a question with Mr. Webster. First question is, explain why you have decided to run for election in 2017 and why Georgetown East voters should elect you as their candidate to serve in the LA. I've decided to, thank you, um, Paul, for that question. And first, um, good evening to the listening audience and for those who are streaming in and also those who are watching from their homes with television. I decided to run for political office because I've seen the young people of this country being so disheartened with the way things are going. So I decided that to give them hope and for them to fulfill their aspirations, I wanted to run for political office. And this is why I'm running for this 2017 general election. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webster. Mr. Mataggart, same question to you, sir. Why have you decided to run for, in your case, re-election in 2017? And why should Georgetown East voters elect you as their candidate of choice in the Legislative Assembly? Thank you very much. Um, basically, I decided to run again because the business of the government of which I am a part remains unfinished. There is much that we have done and accomplished, but which there were many things, I think, that have, we, because of the passage of time, we were not able to accomplish. I believe that the same skills and the experience that I have and brought to the table in 2013 are still as relevant as they are today. And I believe that I have all the skills and the experience that I can bring to the table to a second term of a progressives government. 
and I am therefore seeking re-election as a part of the progressives. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Ms. Borden, same question to you. Explain why you have decided to run for election in 2017 and why Georgetown East voters should elect you as their candidate of choice for the Legislative Assembly. Thank you, Paul. I decided to accept the challenge of running in this general election because there are things that are happening in this community and things that are happening in business and education that need to be fixed. I would like the opportunity to make a difference in this, these islands and this community and I know that my experience has shown me what the problems are and my experience has also showed me how to fix them and if elected I promise I will do exactly that. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Ralston, explain why you have decided to run for office in 2017 and why Georgetown East voters should elect you as their candidate of choice for the Legislative Assembly. Thank you, Paul. Good evening, everyone, and to all those watching from home. This is my second attempt to fill a seat in our parliament, and as last time, this time I'm driven by the fact that our education system has failed our youth. For 16 years now, I have watched good, healthy lives filter through a broken education system, only to be delivered out at the end with hopelessness for not being able to attain the jobs and the careers that they've aspired to, simply because we had the resources, but we did not have the political will to help these young people. And I am not prepared to sit out another four years and watch one more of our children's lives go down the tubes. So my, I am here for one purpose and one purpose only, and they're sitting right there on that pew for the youth of the Cayman Islands. Our next question focuses on crime and public safety, and we will always rotate the question so a different person starts each question. So on this next question, we will start with Mr. McTaggart. Businesses and residents are becoming increasingly concerned about the level of serious crime being committed and the use of illegal weapons. What new strategies or resources would you recommend to arrest this situation? Well, I have two solutions, none of which really cost us any money to do. I think it is absolutely imperative that the, between the police and the community that the relationship has to be <coughs> restored between the two. It has broken down over the years, and there is a level of distrust. In order for the police to effectively do their work, there must be that respect, there must be that participation and engagement with private citizens in this country. Imperative. The second thing I would suggest is that it is imperative as well for the police that they have got to engage with the private sector and they have got to engage with the community and play their part in restoring the confidence that has been lost. It is also imperative, I think, that the police themselves make use of all of the resources that they have available to themselves to combat crime. I'll give you a very good example. My brother is sitting, in, sitting here in the audience. He is the deputy commandant of the specials. Specials themselves are not effectively used by the police. Yes, they are volunteers, but they are trained to the same high standards that our regular police are trained to. And yet still, they are not effectively used. They could be used in so many different ways. At the moment, what we do with them is that we allow them to attend major public functions and to maintain peace and order there. But they could just as easily take on patrol duties community policing, any number of other things that would free up our police to concentrate and put their effort and time into solving and dealing with the more egregious crime that takes place in this community. Those two simple things, I think, would go a long way towards helping us to deal with the issues of crime. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. <laughs> Ms. Borden, same question to you. Businesses and residents are becoming increasingly concerned 
about the level of serious crime being committed and the use of illegal weapons. What new strategies or resources would you recommend to resolve this situation? Well, I think we have to recognize that crime falls into three different categories here. Um, there's petty crime, uh, there's gang-related offenses, and then there is organized crime, which has come in, and um, we need regional help to deal with that. Community policing is also very important because um, if police get, if people in the community get to know the, their police officer or their beat officer, it is easier for them to um, give information and also for the police to monitor um, what's happening in the districts. Um, as far as the gangs are concerned, that is a much bigger problem and um, I think that we might need to go a little further than um, just looking at it from an interdiction point of view, but more later. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Rolston, businesses and residents are becoming increasingly, con increasingly concerned about the level of serious crime being committed and the use of illegal weapons. What new strategies or resources would you recommend to resolve this situation? Thank you, Paul. We have a National Security Council that I don't think has met. Um, certainly it hasn't met it with the frequency that, we would be, that would be desirable so that, that we know what is going on in our policing. We know what's going on in our environment, but we don't know what actions are being taken to address that crime. We have a uniform support group who are highly trained, and my recommendation would be to give them the, the tools that they need in order to be more effective in their roles, and if that requires more, you know, adding more uh, to their number. Um, but again, crime, as you said, it, it's a higher level of crime, which requires more expertise. And uh, my, my objective would be to give those, the uniform services group, sorry, uniform support group, the resources that they need to deal with, with serious crime. Now we have crime, as Ms. Baden has alluded to, in, in other areas, and, and that's, a, I guess, a topic for, for later on, but to deal with serious crime, that would be my recommendation. I would certainly ensure that if the governor wasn't calling the National Security Council meetings, then I would be bending the Premier's ear all day long to ensure that those meetings are taking place so that the Legislative Assembly can be informed and so that the wider public can also be informed. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Webster, businesses and residents are becoming increasingly concerned about the level of serious crime being committed and the use of illegal weapons. What new strategies or resources would you recommend to solve this situation? Thank you, um, Paul, for that question. The police officers within the country do not solve crimes. It's a community that solves the crimes. Building a holistic community relationship with the police and having great neighborhood watch will help give the police the information and necessary things that they need to be able to combat crime. In respect to the public and the commercial businesses, more training is necessary to be able to train the security officers and to also provide more funding for the cadet corps so that we'll be able to have them as the next revolving entity into the police department. And that's going to be the basis of putting them in such a position that they'll be much more disciplined as youth for this country and be able to emerge to become some, um, some of the best police officers and hopefully the next commissioner of police. I think it's important that we work together as a community to be able to combat this particular type of crime. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webster. Our next question, we will start with Ms. Borden. The average daily prison population since 2012 has hovered around 200 persons with the average inmate age being 35 years old. Most inmates are Caymanian, many of whom recommit offenses once they are released. What programs would you recommend to address this problem? 
There are specific programs um, for prisons to deal with recidivism, and I know a group I was working with, the National Drug Council, had looked at this very carefully. Um, unfortunately, recommendations from <coughs> groups um, don't, don't always fall on fertile ground, <laughs> and uh, this was never undertaken, but they still exist, and there are other things that can be put in place um, to address the problems as well. One of the issues is that when people leave prison, they don't perhaps, ha they have to go back into the environments in which they, from which they came. Um, this is something that has, is being looked at as we speak because if they go back into their communities, then the chances of recidivism is very high. Also, um, it's a question of jobs. Are they coming out of prison with enough training to actually make a living for themselves? So yes, there are, um, there are answers to this question and um, I hope to see them materialize in the very near future. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Ralston. The average daily prison population since 2012 has hovered around 200 persons with the average inmate age being 35 years old. Most inmates are Caymanian, many of whom recommit offenses once they are released. What programs would you recommend to address this problem? Thank you, Paul. This is the reason that I think education is so important because I think studies were shown that a high percentage of those numbers are actually persons who fell through the cracks during the education process because they had ADHD or a learning disability that had not been diagnosed. And so they ended up, you know, without jobs, committing crimes, and ended up in, in Her Majesty's prison. I believe that it's unfortunate that, that they're repeat offenders, and some of them probably have nowhere else to go. And so many of them have lost hope for life. Um, I believe the prison has programs that does try to rehabilitate those individuals. I would certainly try to augment those programs, but they'll only work as well as how those prisoners will, or citizens will perform in their environments that they are released to. I think the, um, the rehab homes that have tried to help them perhaps could have better guidance and, and better resources and support so that the recidivism does not continue to, to just cycle over and over again. But again, I think, you know, let's just stop those numbers at 200 as bad as they are. Let's improve our education system so that we don't end up with any more of our children in the same kind of circumstance. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Webster. The average daily prison population since 2012 has hovered around 200 persons with the average inmate age being 35 years old. Most inmates are Caymanian, many of whom recommit offenses once they are released. What programs would you recommend to address this problem? Thank you, um, Paul. I think we need to introduce a crime prevention program that will be able to assist some of these offenders. We also have to look at a program that is going to help with rehabilitation and also to look on the laws and the offenses that surround the nature of these offenders to be able to give them a second chance in our community. How can we have a community, a growing building community with offenders that are not given a second chance and you have people from all walks of life that we have no evidence in respect to what sort of convictions that they have I think we need to make sure that we retool these individuals to be able to work and cope with the jobs that are available to them at first hand. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, Mr. McTaggart, same question to you, sir. The average daily prison population since 2012 has hovered around 200 persons with the average inmate age being 35 years old. Most of these inmates are Caymanian, many of whom recommit offenses once they are released. What programs would you recommend to address this problem? Well, I think you're dead right. Um, and for a large number of our prison population, it is just a revolving door in and out. So somewhere in this system, we are failing them. Um, I do know that there are a number of programs that the prison system has in place to allow 
prisoners to obtain um, technical and vocational skills, learning opportunities, and in effect give them some skills that when they do get back into society, they have something that they can go and search for with a job, search for a job. Where I think we are truly failing them is that we do not prepare them for entry back into society. And society itself is not prepared to receive them back into in, and assimilate them into the community. As a result, when they are released, they're released back into the same conditions from which they came. And their chances and prospects of getting employment is pretty much slim to none, simply because of the fact that they have a criminal conviction they are shunned and avoided by employers. And so that attitude and mindset in my mind has to change. And that we have to have employers who are more willing to give our prisoners and release prisoners, once they've served their time, a second chance. That's a critical component to the success and to the rehabilitation of our prisoners, people who have been confined, and it will help go a long way towards solving that round door, that, that revolving door issue. Thank you. We will start the next question with Ms. Rolston, and this focuses more on the local district issues. Ms. Rolston, what do you consider to be the top issue affecting Georgetown East constituency, and how would you address it if elected? Well, Paul, as you know, the Georgetown East constituency um, has a very interesting and diverse demographic. Uh, so the needs of some of the people on one end are, are not the same as those on the other. And so I have to address both, both sides. Um, I think, and, and many of them are overarching and affect all of us. Of course, there on one end, there's the issue of unemployment or underemployment, the fear of people losing their homes, um, people just having a hard time keeping up with the, the high cost of living and of getting their children the, the educations that they need. On the other side, there's a greater concern probably for the uh, business sector to ensure that our financial services industry remains vibrant so that we don't lose our standing as a, a major offshore player. And there are envir environmental issues that I think that they're also concerned with um, South Sound in particular is a very pristine, beautiful area of the island. And I think residents, they will want to ensure that, that their property is protected and that there's not massive overdevelopment in their community. And I would do everything within my power to address the needs of, of both of those demographics. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Webster, what do you consider to be the top issue affecting the Georgetown East constituency, and how would you address it if elected? Thank you, Paul, for that question. Going around the Georgetown East area, I identify that one of the most top problems in Georgetown East is flooding. When the development, or most of the development in Georgetown East was constructed, they had dreams that were suited for that particular time. Currently today, those drains are ineffective. The size of the drainage pipes and the wells are not deep enough to be able to facilitate the amount of infrastructure that is constantly happening within Georgetown East, especially now where we have the extension of the new Linford Pearson Highway. As this continues to grow, we're gonna have more problems with flooding within that area. So I think this is one of the top priorities that I would face and tackle on day one because I think it's an important issue for all residents to keep them safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. McTaggart, what do you consider to be the top issue affecting the Georgetown East constituency and how would you address it if elected? In my canvassing of the constituents in Georgetown East, I found a number of issues that they have identified as being of real concern to them. But when I take and I put it all together and distill it and take it and pull it apart, the one common theme that I have found is they're most concerned about is that we continue to have 
a growing and thriving economy, but for different reasons. If you look, and other candidates have mentioned the, you know, the distinction between the affluent communities in Georgetown East and those who are and, and uh, the, more, the middle class community. In the South Sound area, they want prosperity and development to continue because they know that there's a direct correlation between crime and high employ unemployment. And as we can continue to grow our economy, they know that opportunities will arise for people to be employed and thereby reduce the crime that exists and continues to plague our society. They're also deeply concerned about the future of the financial services industry and the, the attacks that are taking place internationally on it. And we know the, the, the significant contribution it makes to the overall economy of the Cayman Islands. If you look at the, um, the, the middle class section of, the, um, of, of our Georgetown East, they are con truly concerned about the availability of jobs for them, for them to continue to work and to provide for their family. So it's more fundamental to them. So that would be the one thing that I, I think is, uh, is a topmost concern. Thank you. Ms. Borden, same question to you. Um, as the other panelists have said, uh, our constituency covers quite a di diverse area. Um, you've gone from South Sound to Randyke to Bimini to Fairbanks, some of Old Crew Road, um, and each has distinct issues. The one thing that is common to all is neglect. I think that once politicians have run and they've got into office, suddenly, you know, they disappear and the promises disappear and, um, and they're left for another four years and another group comes along and it's like, will this make a difference? Um, we see in the more upscale areas uh, concern with immigration, especially the permanent residence issue that we're facing. Um, we, the environment, certainly. Is there going to be a dock in Georgetown? I get this all the time. If so, what's going to happen to Seven Mile Beach? And what's going to happen to the rest of us? You've got people who don't have homes, they don't have food, they don't have jobs, and this is specific to special areas of Georgetown East. And you've got others whose main concern is education of their children and jobs for their children and making enough money and having enough services to be able to provide for some dignity in their family life. But I think that the one thing that they will all say is, where are the promises? What are you going to do for us if we elect you? Are, you, are we going to see you again? And I told them, yes, you will see me every couple of months. Thank you. Well, that concludes the first rounds of questions. We'll be right back after these short, this short commercial break. Are you looking for amazing deals, great products, or instant cash? Then look no further than Cash Whiz. We sell quality, pre-owned items at amazing prices, such as cell phones, laptops, jewelry, high-end watches, cars, boats, and so much more. We also buy items. Just got the latest smartphone and not sure what to do with your latest model? Then bring it to us for instant cash. In need of some quick cash but don't want to sell your items? Then use our buyback option. We will purchase your item at a price and then hold it for 30 days, which then you can buy the item back within the time frame or pay a fee to extend the time period. Almost any item can be used. We also offer a layaway program. See an item that you like but need extra time before purchasing? Then pay 25% down and we'll hold the item for up to 90 days. We can also sell items for you. Cash Wiz, visit us today. It's fresh, fresh from the garden, it's fresh. Fresh from the baker, it's fresh. Fresh from the fisherman, always have right. It's fresh. Fresh from the butcher, it's fresh. 
Fresh from the deli, it's fresh. Fresh from the summer rain. Always at Hurley's. At Hurley's, everything is fresh. And we mean everything. Welcome back to the First Baptist Church, where we have four of the candidates for Georgetown East, Sharon Rolston, Teresa Bodden, Roy McTaggart, and Kenrick Webster. We now move to the second round of questions, and we'll begin with the topic of minimum wage. Thanks, Will. We'll start this next question with Mr. Webster. During this election, some candidates have recommended an increase in the $6 per hour minimum wage, which was just introduced in March 2016. Do you agree why or why not? Thank you, um, Paul, for that question. With the minimum wage currently where it is, I think it's not affordable for our society to maintain their family on $6 per hour. I did a cost analysis about five years ago for my company internally, and I've been paying a minimum of $7.50 per hour because I felt that it was necessary to make sure that those persons would be able to financially support their families. So I think it would be something that I would want to address to ensure especially in the, into the tourism sector, where some aspects of the tourism sector has $4 as a minimum wage. I think we need to look at that to be able to attract more Caymanians into the tourism industry, which makes up most of our GDP here in the Cayman Islands. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Webster. Mr. McTaggart, during this election, some candidates have recommended an increase in the $6 per hour minimum wage, which was just introduced in March 2016. Do you agree with that change? Why or why not? I do not support such a change. And let me make me unequivocal about it. And here's why. It would be one of the biggest breaks on the economy that you could ever impose. I had great fears when we were introduced the $6 in 2016 that there, would be made, there could be ramifications with regard to employment and businesses failing as a result of it. Happily, we have not seen this, the effects, although there have been some. But a $12 minimum wage would be a major constraint on the ability of businesses to survive and to provide for it, it, for all employers. It would also and would be very introduce um, inflation, bring inflation in a big way into the economy because at the end of the day, someone's got to pay. So I definitely would not support an increase in, in to $12 per hour. Thank you. Ms. Borden, during this election, some candidates have recommended an increase in the $6 per hour minimum wage, which was just introduced in March 2016. Do you agree with such a change? Why or why not? I have a problem with the minimum wage because I think it can be abused and people who should be earning more are being tied to it. I also question whether it's a livable wage. Um, I'm not... I'm not confident that this issue of a minimum wage, of introducing a minimum, has really solved the problem. Um, and I would not, I wouldn't recommend that we move it unless we know why we're moving it and what we need to move it to. Thank you. Ms. Ralston? Some candidates have recommended an increase in the 
per hour minimum wage, which was just introduced in March 2016. Do you agree with such a change? Why or why not? No, I don't, Paul. And I don't really subscribe to having a minimum wage because it only serves to drive up the costs um, for small business owners in particular. And uh, I believe that the only people that really benefit from it and, and you know, nothing against them are the, the people that, that send their money home every week. Um, it is really, you know, and probably rightly so, allowed them to, to gain more, but they also send more money off the island, and it doesn't address the need of our own, needs of our own people. I think that minimum wage, I think the reason it took 20 years to, to actually come into law is because it is such a, a controversial uh, area, and it does nothing to really um, improve the lives of, of the Caymanian people. I think the direction that we need to go is to determine livable wages based on industry and based on the person's um, skill set. Um, because uh, it's just, I wouldn't show up to a job. I wouldn't feel inclined to show up on time or at all for, if, I would, if I knew I was going to make $6 an hour. And from that, my health and pensions had to come and I had to provide a school lunch for my children. We can see you know, the, the effects of that. So I absolutely would not support an increase in the minimum wage, and I would try to move away from that, if at all possible, um, to consider more livable wages based on, like I said, the, the person's abilities. Thank you. Our next question focuses on health care, and we will start this question with Mr. McTaggart. What improvements, if any, would you recommend to improve access and change in the cost of health care for the elderly and vulnerable in our society? I should probably repeat that question. What improvements, if any, would you recommend to improve access as well as the cost of health care for the elderly and vulnerable in our society? Let me deal first with the, with the access, particularly with regard to the elderly. There is, within the government, programs available to ensure that any elderly person who has needs for health care but unable to afford it can obtain it. There is a process that must be completed, but once a person has been approved for health care in the Cayman Islands, they are able to access all the services and all the medical help and care that they need. So the position, the, the, the programs are already there. It's a matter of educating the public um, if, they're, if they're not aware of it, that these things are available for them. In terms of the cost of health care, now, the biggest, is, the biggest way in which we can influence and improve the cost of health care in this country is through the usage of our health care, of, of our health insurance. Every insurance carrier I have ever spoken to, to has told me the biggest problem they have is the usage of the, the, um, of, the, of the system. Many people have developed a habit of going to doctors and going seeking medical care when they don't really need it. And that drives the cost up for everyone. I'll give you an example. In my law firm, before I retired, we saw 15, 20, 30 percent increases year after year in health insurance premiums. When we, did, when we analyzed it, it all came down to usage. And when we implemented a wellness program in our firm, what we too saw was that the, 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 um, the premiums come right down. Today, I'm paying 50 percent of what I paid in 2012, purely because of education and bringing the usage down. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Ms. Bodden, what improvements, if any, would you recommend to improve access as well as the cost of health care for the elderly and vulnerable in our society? The elderly and the vulnerable do not have good access to health care. They have issues with actually getting their medication. They can go and see the doctor, that's fine but they have issues with medication. It's often expensive. Um, 
and I'm told that there are also difficulties in getting dental work done and it's almost as if the insurance and what government provides can only cover doctor's visits. Um, medication is a huge issue and the cost of medicines and this is something that government needs to be picking up. We've got what 55, 60 million in our social services budget. Why isn't this going to the poor and the elderly? I'm not talking about insurance that other people are paying that they have access to. But why aren't we taking care? Why isn't government able to take care of the vulnerable and the elderly and the poor when there's money allocated to it? Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Rolston. What improvements, if any, would you recommend to improve access as well as the cost of health care for the elderly and vulnerable in our society? Thank you. I don't think I need to recommend anything because we have a national health um, plan, strategic plan, that has never been implemented. We know that there were a vast amount of resources and expertise poured into a five-year plan, which expires now. Um, that has never been implemented, implemented that addressed those very needs as well as the health needs of our wider community. And so we have the information that we need and we have the recommendations that we need to ensure that our elderly and indeed all, the most vulnerable in our society, a lot of children particularly disabled and, uh, and children who have not, um, who have de developmental needs have been left out of the system. But there is a plan. We just need to be able to get it implemented. And that would be one of the things that I would strongly, uh, would be top of my agenda. Because I've seen it for myself, and I've seen the suffering of all of our people. And that health report also addresses, or health policy also addresses, the, the cost of health insurance. We know that currently our Health Insurance Commission is working with, I think, three enforcement officers the same number that they were that they started out with in 2004, and despite the fact that there are over 20,000 new subscribers to the health insurance um, in the health insurance industry, we still have three enforcement officers. So it's not for me to sit here and say what I would do. The first, well, it is actually I would take that plan and I would get it implemented because the answers are there. We have the answers. We just don't want to pick up the paper and look at them and see how they need to be addressed and most importantly, have the political will to get them addressed. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Webster, what improvements, if any, would you recommend to improve access and cost of health care for the elderly and vulnerable in our society? Thank you, Paul, for that question. Uh, we have an existing system with Cineco that is working. It just needs to to have a little bit more teeth to it, to be able to allow these people, the elderly, to be able to get better access. There's other types of policies that could be developed, universal type insurance that has many, many benefits to it, but would also be able to have a low, low premium rate. But overall, healthcare is a very complex issue globally. I think it all starts with the young people. We need to start educating, bringing awareness about healthy lifestyles, the way that they can actually prevent some of the issues before um, they get to the age that they are. By introducing these type of things into some of the schools, and also bringing awareness to the adults. This would help our cost, bringing down the cost, but more importantly, to ensure that there's a medical certified board that practitioners in this country do not take advantage of us, the consumers, to drive up the cost of premiums in this country. And I think that is where we need, what we need to address. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to education, and we will start this question with Ms. Bodden. Would you support the creation of a public-private partnership for the management and oversight of the public education system in the Cayman Islands? Um, yes, public-private 
um, relationships with education is very important. But what I would say is that I find, and I've worked with educators before, and teachers and principals, they know what their school need, what their schools need. They just often don't have the funding or, or the will to help them with it. So what I'd like to see is for more um, authority to be given back to the schools itself, themselves. And yes, government can keep whatever, set the standards, do the, um, do the assessments. But I'd like to see the schools themselves empowered a little more because uh, for a school to really be successful, you need a partnership between the board, the teachers, the parents, and the kids. And the kids will tell you what they need and want as well. It mightn't be everything you want to give them, but they have ideas. And I think that this is, we need to get back to communities. And in education, the school needs to be a community. And it needs to, um, it needs to take responsibility for itself. And I think that only with this, um, Will there be enough interest for them to move forward and for education to really blossom in this country? Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Ralston, would you support the creation of a public-private partnership for the management and oversight of the public education system in the Cayman Islands? Absolutely, Paul. If we look back on the last 16 years we've had, two different political parties fighting over education. One proposes one thing, the next one comes and proposes something else. And our children's lives hang in the balance. In 16 years, we could have taken a child from reception straight through to high school by now. But our education system has not improved. In, in fact, it's probably deter deteriorated in that space of time. And that tells me that our government has done an abysmal failure at managing the education system. And I would absolutely support having a public-private relationship where private enterprise runs the schools. If you look at it, the private schools here do a phenomenal job of providing our children with a top quality education. If you look at the public schools, not so. And guess what? It costs our government 33% more per student to educate a child in our public school system. Folks, there's something wrong with that business model. And so I believe the solution is to take education out of the hands of government, take it out of the political cycle, and let's get our children educated so they can have the same dreams and the same aspirations as all the kids who are having a private education. We can do it. There's a lot of private sector partners out there who want to help. Not, not to get money, but to, to help our children because they've seen the failures as well. And we will never have a vibrant economy with low unemployment unless we get our children the best tools that they need to make their contributions to the world. So yes, I would be absolutely supportive of that. In fact, that would be top on my agenda. And last, the last go around, it was. We, we determined that that was the best way forward to take education. I'm not saying they don't have a role, government doesn't have a role, but we, we have seen by practice that the private sector can do a much better job. Let's bring in their expertise and let's give our kids the best opportunities. Thank you. Mr. Webster, would you create, would you support the creation of a public-private partnership for the management and oversight of the public education system in the Cayman Islands? Thank you, Paul, for that question. I think uh, working with the private sector is very important, and it works. Currently, with my business, I work with the government, and change of governments um, with edu in respect to education. The Passport to Success program, which was initi initiated by one of the past ministers, that continues to work today to help empower some of the young people that has fallen through the cracks. They have just celebrated last week the 22nd cohort, and I am one of the major sponsors in respect to that particular program. So I think it works, and it can continue to work to build a better education system. But most importantly, we need to take politics out of the, out of the education system for too long. Politics have played 
a serious role in the education system to deteriorate and to disenfranchise our children. For example, some politicians will come in as a minister, the pass mark or the percentage of children that has passed is 60%. Because of personality, one wants to outshine the other, so they lower the pass mark. That disenfranchises that child because they want to have a 70% just to look good on their resume. I think we need to stop that. We need to make sure that we look at our young people in this country, provide the best programs, provide the best support for them to be able to get not only tertiary education, but also to be able to get um, education, um, TVEC um, programs, also to be able to have programs in place that they'll be able to advance themselves, online programs that will be able to empower them as youth in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Epstein. Same question, Mr. McTaggart. Should I repeat it? Please. Okay. Would you support the creation of a public-private partnership for the management and oversight of the yeah. public education system in this country? Public-private partnerships, governments the world over, are finally waking up to the real benefits of entering into such relationships, not just for education, but for many other services which they can and do need to provide. So there is a strong case to be made for the introduction of public-private partnerships in our education system. I am aware of the existence of a report that recommends, um, re recommends such a, a course of action. But what that report recommends is, is really the wholesale relinquishment of government involvement and responsibility. I'm not sure we're ready for that. Having said that, there is a strong role, a major role, to be a um, major opportunity for government to seek to involve the private sector much more closely in the education system. But it has to be done in a very strategic way to ensure that we truly deal with the issues that exist within education and that we are able to derive the benefits from us. Public-private partnerships can be very successful. They can also be spectacular failures. And so it is imperative, whatever route we take, that if we pursue public-private partnerships that they are structured properly so that the state benefits and gets the, 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 um, the, realizes the benefits that it is looking and also that the private sector is able to, to derive the benefits that it is seeking from such a relationship. Thank you. Our, Our next question, we will start with uh, Ms. Rolston. The two pillars of the economy are financial services and tourism. The main pillars are. These pillars are vulnerable to external economic shocks. Would you support diversification into any other sectors? If yes, which sectors would you like to seek to attract to the Cayman Islands? Paul, I believe that a bird in, hand, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And so I believe that we need to make, make sure that our financial services and our tourism industry are uh, safeguarded. Um, and I think the best way to achieve that is to go back to the time when government um, had a public-private consultative committee that met regularly with the private sector to keep the barometer on the things that are changing in the financial services and in the tourism industry. So I would support that and, and to ensure that those two industries, because you know they are robust and they do provide us with, with um, a good return. Um, having said that, I believe in the tourism industry there is room for further um, exploration. I, think, I don't think we've exploited medical and um, sports tourism you know, to the, its full extent, so I would, I would certainly advocate for that, as well as ecotourism, which is something that our sister islands benefit from. And kudos to the Rock Iguana Limited, who've just started the rock, and rock climbing on the bluff and rappelling. That attracts that type of um, tourist that the BRAC has not had before. Um, I think we need to safeguard ecotourism in Little Cayman, which is the thrust of its economy. But having said that, I think that private sector, uh, private enterprise should drive new enterprise or new industries to Cayman. I think keep government out of it as far as possible. Government's job is to lay the, the groundwork to create the environment that fosters 
um, more opportunity and diversification. And I'll give you a case in point. Uh, we have a problem with the invasive species of iguanas and lionfish. So our problem became somebody's opportunity. They set up a business where they would get our iguanas and our lionfish, process them here, and export them to the United States. They made the investment. They got all of the US FDA approvals for the quality of the meat, the, the processes for transport. But guess where the bottleneck is? Right here, in our government, four years on. So while we need to diversify our economy, government's role is to ensure that the, it creates the environment so it doesn't regulate people to death, all the regulations are necessary. Well, government is to be the facilitator of that. The private enterprise should drive it. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Webster, the two main economic pillars are financial services and tourism. These pillars are vulnerable to external economic shocks. Would you support diversification into any other sector? And if yes, which sectors would you seek to attract to the Cayman Islands? Uh, thank you, um, Paul, for that question. Uh, diversification um, of another avenue in respect to um, a growth can be done in many um, areas, but I believe firmly that we need to continue to grow the two existing pillars that we have. And one of the ways to generate more business in respect to that is to build a world-class conference center that will attract much more businesses such as uh, conferences. You can even bring shows here to the Cayman Islands and this would also complement. But most of all, I think it's imperative for us to train, to, have a, to expand on our hospitality training to ensure that the people, the human resources are available and that we can give our people here employment and to be able to provide quality service so that when people come here, not only within the tourism industry, but for the financial industry, to make sure that we have them available and train. And in respect to that, to also build relationships with other neighboring companies to be able to defend our financial industry here in the Cayman Islands. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McTaggart, same question. Two main economic pillars are financial services and tourism. These pillars are vulnerable to ec external economic shocks. Would you support diversification into any other sector? And if yes, which sectors would you seek to attract to this country? Diversification of the economy. It's got to be one of the great desires of any government because what that does is ensure your economic growth and stability, one of the great contributors. Financial services and tourism are the two mainstays. Tourism is a very fickle industry. It changes with economic times and has its ups and downs. We are seeing to the attacks on the financial services industry, so it's imperative that we look for alternatives. Within financial services, there are opportunities. There are opportunities in reinsurance companies, and we've had some success in attracting reinsurers to these shores with physical presences. That needs to continue. We must market it and exploit it. There, we also must ensure that we remain competitive in providing the, the products and service, the products that the financial services industry continues to demand that others and our competitors are responding to as well. I see great opportunities for us in healthcare. Health City is a great asset to this country and the work that they do is incredible. There are also opportunities now you are seeing businesses move here engaged in stem cell research and stem cell treatment. It is a very active and growing area for us. There is also, I'm also aware of one company that's actually involved in drug um, testing and drug development. Tremendous opportunities for us in healthcare and we need to take it and to exploit it for all it's worth. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. <laughs> Ms. Borden, the two main economic pillars are financial services and tourism. 
These pillars are vulnerable to external economic shocks. Would you support diversification into any other sector? If yes, which sectors would you seek to attract to the Cayman Islands? We've been trying to diversify our economy for the past 30 years, and we will continue to try and diversify it. But the fact remains that um, financial services and tourism continue to be the main drivers of our, our economy. Um, as long as these can function without, um, without too many constraints, unnecessary constraints, other, other um, diversification come from these. For example, medical tourism, we know the Shetty Hospital, there have been others as well, um, less high profile. Sports tourism is something that we could look at more closely because this is a real possibility for us. We need infrastructure, there are certain things that have to be put in place, but this is an area in which diversification could take place. Um, educational facilities here, that's all satellite campuses from other um, universities, satellite hospitals from other medical centers. Um, not competing with anything that's, that's here, but certainly this has been done in, um, in the Dominican Republic very successfully, and uh, there's no reason why we can't look at doing that here. There is scope for diversification, um, but people are not going to invest unless there is um, stability, unless financials or financial services are stable and can continue to expand and unless tourism um, remains a very strong component of our, economy, of our economy. Thank you, Ms. Bowden. That concludes the second round of questions. After this short message, we'll be accepting questions from the audience. Please stay tuned. Looking for quality products with the best prices? Then come to Uncle Bill's. We carry the best bicycle brands on island. You can also make a custom order and pick up items from our great line of accessories. We have a fantastic range of stainless steel, gas, and charcoal grills. And make sure to check out our great line of DeWalt power tools. Plus our newest product, the FlexVolt. Have the freedom of cordless. Come and visit us today. Uncle Bill's Home Improvement Center. We've already talked about how to grow the Tier 3 economy. Now, let's look at how to grow the economy in Tier 2. Remember, Tier 2 companies provide goods and services to local companies here in the Cayman Islands. So how can we help these companies grow? Let's look at a great example of a Tier 2 company, a commercial landlord. A commercial landlord owns office buildings and rents out the space to other businesses. What would increase demand for office space? Well. If a company lowers the rent or spends more on advertising, it might win more tenants, but only at the expense of some other landlord losing theirs. That's not economic growth. The only thing that will grow the commercial leasing sector as a whole would be an increase in demand for office space. In other words, new companies starting up or existing companies growing and hiring more staff. No matter what type of tier two company you think about, by definition, its growth depends on the growth of other companies. And again, if a new commercial landlord came along, that wouldn't represent economic growth because they would just take demand away from all the others. That's not growing the pie. That's just giving everyone a smaller slice. In the next video, we'll look at how to grow the economy in tier one, the most important tier of all for our economy. For now, thanks for watching. And remember to share this video with your family and friends so they can learn more about our economic prosperity engine. Children are our future, so let's preserve the ecosystems of Cayman by using cleaner gas. Using propane releases 80% fewer harmful emissions into the environment and saves you significantly on your energy spent annually. Working with us during the entire process and our outstanding customer service will make you know that you made the right choice. By partnering with ProSolar, we are also able to provide solutions for zero net energy homes. Clean gas, superior energy, the smarter choice.
we've already looked at how to grow tiers 2 and 3 of our economy. All the companies that provide goods and services to other businesses and residents here in Cayman. To sum it all up, the easiest way to grow the economy in tiers 2 and 3 is to grow the economy in tier 1. That's because tier 1 companies are on the front lines of our economy, doing business with overseas customers, bringing money into the country, and spending it in the local economy. That's why tier 1 is like the gas tank of our economic prosperity engine. To understand a bit more about tier 1 companies, let's look at what they have in common. First, unlike companies that do business with customers here in Cayman, international tier 1 companies don't need to be physically located in the same place as their customers. That's a double-edged sword. Being flexible is what allowed them to come to Cayman in the first place. But it also means, unlike companies in tiers 2 and 3, they can also go somewhere else. Second, these international companies sell services rather than products. That's great for the economy, because service companies need to hire people to deliver their services. That means tier 1 companies create good quality jobs. Finally, while companies in tiers 2 and 3 are competing against other companies here in Cayman, businesses in tiers 1 compete against other companies all around the world. So while our local rules and regulations give local companies a level playing field, those rules can either be an advantage or disadvantage to the international companies in tier 1. So let's recap. Tier 1 companies are vital to the economy. They could be physically based almost anywhere in the world. They normally sell services, not products. They need to hire people to provide those services, and they compete in international markets against other companies all around the world. Now that we have a better understanding of Tier 1 companies, we're in a better position to think of ways we could help the Tier 1 economy grow. We'll get to that in the next episode. For now, thanks for watching. And remember to share this video with your family and friends so they can learn more about our economic prosperity engine. If it matters to you, it matters to us. We're Cayman 27, Cayman Informed. Welcome back to the First Baptist Church, where we have four of the candidates for Georgetown East, Sharon Rolston, Teresa Bodden, Roy McTaggart, and Kenrick Webster. We now turn the questions, now we're receiving questions from the audience, so I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Paul Biles. <laughs> Thanks. Our first audience question is, we will start this question with um, Mr. Webster. Another political candidate is in favor of taxing the public to pay for education, so essentially free education. Are you in favor of this? Thank you, um, Paul, for that question. It all depends on what area of taxation that they propose to do it. Um, in respect to education, which is near and dear to my heart, whatever it takes to be able to fund education, I am all for that. I think that um, the taxation can come in different forms, and I would just like to be able to see exactly what format that has been proposed. But to say yes to that question and not being clear with what exactly they are proposing and what area, then I think it's unfair to say that. But education definitely needs the necessary funding. Funding that has been removed from education, diverted into roads and other areas, I think that needs to come back so that our people can be prepared to deal with all of the employment opportunities that are available to them in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webster. <laughs> Same question to Mr. McTaggart. Another political candidate is in favor of taxing the public in order to pay for education. Are you in favor of this change? Mm -hmm. Paul, the, the questioner just doesn't 
tell us what kind of taxation you're looking at, whether it's sort of income taxation or indirect taxation. Uh, so it's difficult to, to understand where they're coming from with it. But I would say as a general rule, I am opposed to any new taxes and any increases in taxes at this point in time. For the last four years, this government has been developing and we have produced some significant surpluses that allowed us to repay debt early and have allowed us to set aside significant reserves. And what we can do and should do as we move forward is using some of the, the excess funds to invest in education and we can do that quite easily. Um, the funds are there to, to enable us to. Thank you. Ms. Borden, another candidate is in favor of taxing the public in order to pay for education. Are you in favor of this policy change? Ab sorry, absolutely not. We need to spend money on education at every level. <laughs> education doesn't have the infrastructure it needs. It doesn't have the support it needs. And hopefully, um, this will come about in the next four years. Um, from, from daycare straight through to students leaving university and coming back and not being able to find jobs, every aspect of education needs to be looked at and we need to put money into it. But this country has the resources and the funds necessary to cover anything that reasonable that it needs. We can't have, what is it called, champagne tastes in a beer bottle pocket? No. And I'll be honest with you, I, I just don't understand some of the fiscal policies. We can cover our costs, we can provide for our country what it needs, and we should be doing this. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Rolston, another candidate is in favor of taxing the public in order to pay for education. Are you in favor of that change? No, Paul, when I hear the word tax, I shudder. I don't think that our problem in the, in the education uh, department or system is lack of resources. I think it's an improper allocation of those resources. Currently, as I understand it, the way the education budget works is top down so that the bureaucracy gets the, the first cut. And by the time you filter down to the students, there's nothing left. So I think all we have to do for that fix is to reverse the way that we budget from the bottom to the top so that our children get the resource, resources that, that they need in the classroom. And um, so I don't think that we need to to tax anything any further. I think when people hear that word, they'll, they'll, they'll scatter. So um, I'm not in, I, I don't think the Cayman's issue is a revenue issue. I think it, it's a, a spending issue. And I'll give you another example. We have the John Gray High School that has sat in ruins for at least the t last 12 years. And what is the first thing they go to improve upon? A gym for the sole purpose of housing the NCAA basketball tournament here in October. That's a noble cause, but not at the expense of our children's education. Thank you very much. Our next audience question focuses on the Georgetown uh, port facility. We'll start with Mr. McTaggart. What is your view, it is a long question, so bear with me. Uh, what is your view of the long-term sustainability and affordability of proceeding with the Georgetown cruise facility? Its cost to both the country and the environment, as well as existing businesses, and would you support putting the final decision to a national vote? Paul, my considered opinion is that the cruise port and the development of the, the port in Georgetown is absolutely vital to the future success of this country to provide 
remain viable and competitive in the cruise tourism business. And secondly, to ensure our continued success in being able to import the goods that we need. There is a desperate need in addition to those facility, to the cruise, facil cruise berthing facilities for an expansion of the port facilities because they're operating right now at about 80 to 90% of their capacity. Little room for growth. So I don't believe that we have the choice. We have to, do, we have to decide, first of all, do we want to be in, in the cruise tourism business? Then I think that that will drive a number of the other decisions and make the one to, to move forward with the port, with the, developing the cruise berthing facilities uh, that much easier for us. But I believe that it is absolutely vital. Uh, in terms of a national a referendum, I think that if the, uh, the public, there was sufficient demand and you had a properly constituted um, request for referendum, that with the required numbers that are uh, required under the Constitution, fully support it and would say, let's do it if that's what the public want. But uh, I think, you know, that has to be driven from the general public. Thank you, Mr. Mataggart. Ms. Bo <laughs> Bodden, what is your view of the long-term sustainability and affordability of proceeding with the Georgetown cruise facility its costs to both the country and the environment, as well as existing businesses. And would you support putting the final decision to a national vote? Oh, that is a long question. It is. <laughs> One of our problems is that in Grand Cayman, we do not have a natural protected deep water port, as other countries do. But we have the cruise ships that want to come here. We have had, we have spent millions and millions of dollars on studies, on a port, going back for what, 30, 35 years. Um, I think we had a study on a, a, port, a cruise dock, <coughs> East End, the North Zone, Georgetown spots. Nobody could agree on anything. So we're right back to, do we look at where there is less environmental impact for a dock or do we look at putting a dock where businesses currently are? Do we look after our present or do we plan for our future? As for the affordability, um, I'm not sure how. Uh, well, first of all, we have to do an assessment. We have to do a cost-benefit assessment. How much is it going to bring in and how much are we going to pay in terms of loss of the environment and in Georgetown certainly the threat to Seven Mile Beach. Um, right now uh, investors on Seven Mile Beach are extremely concerned about who is going to get in in the next government and what they're going to do because if the dock goes in South Sound there, sorry, in Georgetown, they are worried about their investment on Seven Mile Beach. Um, I think that this is something that needs looking at. I think que more questions need to be asked, more information needs to be obtained before we can move forward with a decision. Something that's taken this long is a problem. I know it's the second one, um, but I would um, Rather than throwing it out to a referendum, I would prefer to sit down and, um, and talk to people, especially environmentalists and all sea captains, and see what they recommend. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Rolston, your turn for our special question. What is your view of the long-term sustainability and affordability of proceeding with a Georgetown cruise facility, its costs to both the country and the environment, as well as existing businesses, and would you support putting the final decision to a national vote? Can I, I'll start with the, the last part of the question. Absolutely, I, would, I think that is an issue of national importance for the simple reason that we're mere trustees of this island. 
for future generations. And <clears throat> I would not want to have it said of me that I destroyed a perfectly, a beautiful gift given to us. Um, I, I would not want to have that decision. I think that decision should be made on a national level because the environment is ours as trustees to pass it on to, to the, the next generation that comes behind us. I do not support the cruise birthing facilities as has been proposed. I, I, don't, I think there may be another plan in the works, but the original plan I do not support for the simple reason that it does not provide um, long-term sustainability and the costs are just too high. The financial model does not work. I think um, the, the increase in, tour, in cruise arrivals is something 2 to 4 percent perhaps over 3 to 4 years and at a cost of 300 million dollars plus I just don't see how that is sustainable. The only way that would work would to involve one of the cruise lines perhaps as a partner but at what cost? What's the quid pro quo? Is it so that they can control the port shops which would be to the, to the detriment of our merchants? Um, cruise birthing facilities will absolutely put our water-based businesses out of business. And so I think when we weigh up the advantages and the disadvantages, the, the unknown risks that a deep water harbour will cause to Georgetown in storms, which we have quite often, um, and to Seven Mile Beach is a bigger concern. But the, the other thing is cruise birthing facilities will be used for, for, for perhaps four or five months out of the year, and those some of those months are our stormiest months. So we will never get away from the tendering services. I think that that needs to be our focus. We need to give the crews, the tenders, tender operators the assurance that they need so that they, they can make the investments that, that, that they need. But um, the long-term sustainability of paying for that port, for the return, I, I don't think it works. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Webster. What is your view of the long-term sustainability and affordability of proceeding with a Georgetown cruise facility, its costs to both the country and the environment, as well as existing businesses? And would you support putting the final decision to a national vote? Uh, thank you, Paul, for that question. As politicians, we can go to the public here of four years and get their input and get their votes. I think something of this magnitude should involve all persons that live and work here in the Cayman Islands because it's a major investment. However, I think that we need to understand how the cruise industry works and being a player within the cruise industry, I think we need to make sure, especially currently where we're having most of the prime real estate being purchased by private individuals there's no beach access available for the cruise lines. And majority of the small businesses, the taxi drivers, depend heavily on being able to take passengers to the beach. There's no beach access available. That's deteriorating. I think it's important if we're going to entertain the ships, we have to make sure that we have the facilities available and it's important, even if government wants to purchase a facility and hire it out and to the private sector to manage it, but it's important because all of the hotels are refusing passengers, cruise passengers from using their facilities. So this is a major, major issue. The increase, for you to get an increase from the cruise lines, it's very difficult. I think if we're going to continue along, along this um, avenue, we need to make sure that if we're going to invest, we need to have proper data to be able to translate the amount of passengers that are coming off on our shores. Currently, if um, 2,500 people arrive on Carnival Sensation, government is paid for the 2,500 people, but no data supports the amount of passengers that arrive on Cayman shores. So are we going to be building a dock for a pier for 2,500 people, or are we going to be building it for 10 people? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webster. Our next question concerns healthcare. Uh, from the audience again, 
Um, it's uh, similar to something you raised earlier, but it's a much more direct question. Uh, a much more direct question, so we'll ask it. And we will start this one with uh, Ms. Bodden. Would you support a national health care system, and why? We need a national health care system um, because we have to provide for our people. Um, how, what form that takes, we need to decide. If what we have now isn't working, then certainly we need to be looking at something that is more um, tailored to our needs here. What I don't really, I think that one of our bigger problems though is um, even with this there will still be a cost of insurance and health insurance is an issue that is very troubling to many people who can barely afford it but need it. Um, I think that if we look at the, not, not just look at our health care facilities here, but look at the programs they're tied into, look at the access that we as Caymanians or residents have to services when we're not well. I would like, rather than just saying yes, I'd like to take a more, a, a wider approach to the whole, to the whole issue of health care hospitals, health insurance, and make sure that we don't go ahead with one thing because it's a good idea and then find out it doesn't work across the board. I think that, I think that planning for anything is very important and I think that if we take things piecemeal, sometimes we create problems down the road that we didn't anticipate. So I'd prefer a broader look at health, health care, hospitals, medical issues, everything, um, before we come to a decision about just one aspect of that. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Rolston, would you support a national health care system and why? No, Paul, I don't, because I think it's easier to learn from other people's mistakes rather than venture down the road and find out yourself that it, that it doesn't work. Um, I think that, that the, the services, health services should be a person's choice. I don't think that someone should, should have to be funneled into a, you know, a, a health service that the government mandates. I think free competition is good. And to that end, I, I'm grateful, in fact, that the Shetty Hospital has come here. The Chrissy Tomlinson Hospital is also privately owned. A national health care um, program would require that government mandated where you received your health care. And I think that that should be a person's choice. Health care is very important. And if you are not able to choose where you want to receive your treatment, I think that unduly restricts um, the person and their freedoms. And so I don't support a national uh, policy on health care. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Webster, would you support a national health care system and why? Thank you very much for that question. As I mentioned earlier, universal health insurance and the Cineco acts now as a, and was designed to be like a national insurance company. Currently, because of the structure with internally, it's not fitting the needs for each and every individual that wants to have health care provided to them. If it's structured right, National health insurance would bring about awareness to the other providers because the national insurance would not just be a standalone. You would still have other providers that could provide insurance privately. So definitely this would be setting the standards and also setting rates that would be very, make it competitive in respect to other insurance providers. So definitely, yes, I would support a national insurance. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McTaggart, would you support a national health care system and why or why not? Well, I remain to be convinced that a national health insurance system is the way to go, so I do not support it. Um, 
What I perceive is that if we were to move down that road, that the cost would increase substantially. And I believe that the most effective and the best way to move forward is with a private sector solution. That is the cheapest way to do it because the private sector is a lot more efficient and effective in delivery of services. Some of the things that I think we would give up if we were to move to a national health insurance scheme would be competition, your choice to be able to choose who you go to for your health care, and also potentially a timely access to health care. I believe that the only way we could ever afford to pay for a national health insurance health uh, care system would be to introduce direct taxation because you would desperately need to have that steady, fixed, and predictable source of income in order to pay for it. And you cannot rely on an indirect method of taxation to pay for something that is so predictable and so fixed in terms of, uh, of, of the actual cost of providing that service. So for all those reasons, I, desperate, I, would, never, I would not support a, um, a nationalized health system. Thank you. start this next question with uh, Ms. Ralston. What is your position on the ongoing LGBT rights debate, particularly with recent headlines surrounding gay equality in the Cayman Islands? Paul, I, um, I am not aware that there's any sector of our population that is discriminated um, against that in a, in, I mean, there is discrimination for women at work, for example, but I'm not aware that there's any particular group that has been targeted because of their beliefs or their values. Cayman has always been a very welcoming, tolerant society, and I believe that when one group tries to assert a greater right than another group, it just deteriorates. And I believe that our goal needs to be that we, we try to live respectful of one another's choices. I think that we need to respect other people's value systems as long as they don't influence yours. What a person does in their own the privacy of their own lives is, is their business and it's their freedom to choose that. So I, I, I just don't see where there is any outright discrimination against that particular demographic. They can own homes, they can work, they can visit public places. They have the same rights and liberties as, as, as everyone else. So I think when we start singling out a particular group that has equal, has, their rights are more equal than, than mine per se, I, I don't think that that's a course that we need to embark upon because when does it, when does it stop? Um, I think all, all of us have a responsibility to live respectful of one another in the good old Caymanian way, just respectful of one another and living in social harmony. That is one of the things that has drawn people to this island for decades for employment because of the social harmony that exists amongst so many different nationalities. And so I think that's a, the responsibility for all of us. Don't try to assert a greater right than anyone else. Just live in harmony with one another. And, and I think we'll all be a better place because of it. Thank you. Mr. Webster, what is your position on the ongoing LGBT rights debate, particularly with recent headlines surrounding gay equality in the Cayman Islands? Thank you, um, Paul, for that question. Again, this is a very sensitive area, but you know, the Cayman Islands has welcomed many, many different nationalities um, within, on its shores, and it clearly shows that we are welcoming to any um, sort of persons, regardless of their religion, regardless of their behaviors. But again, as citizens and as politicians, we have an obligation to hold and withhold the law, which is the highest line of the law, being our constitution, which mandates certain things within it in respect to the LGBT, until people within our society decide that they want to make a change in respect to that, then I think 
I will embrace any persons or persons who are within the LGBT, um, basically, um, to not discriminate in that respect. However, I think if it's something where the um, people of the Cayman Islands want to change, I think it's something that we need to take the referendum. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McTaggart, what is your position on the ongoing LGBT rights debate, particularly with recent headlines surrounding gay equality in the Cayman Islands? Paul, to the extent that there is any discrimination against the LGBT community in this country, I abhor it. And I am firmly of the belief that it is our responsibility as leaders in this community to root it out and put an end to it. As far as um, our Constitution in the Bill of Rights provides for equality under the law and under our Constitution, and we must always uphold it. And so to that extent, I have no issue whatsoever with the LGBT community and supporting their, right, their desire to obtain whatever rights they feel are being denied to them. But, and I think it's, it's important that we, uh, we seek to, to have that level of engagement to understand what the issues are and seek how best to, to address them as a country. Thank you. Ms. Borden, what is your position on the ongoing LGBT rights debate, particularly with recent headlines surrounding gay equality in the Cayman Islands? I think that discrimination in any form is something that is abhorrent to me personally. Anyone, I think it's, it's a little, um, oh, we can't pretend that some form of discrimination doesn't exist in any community. But I don't think that the LGBT um, community is any more discriminated against than other small groups that we have here. And I don't think that the level of discrimination is something that is even worthy of, um, of being noted because I think that one thing that we all have to strive towards here is respect. Respect of each other, respect for each other's rights. I don't um, think the Constitution should be changed. Marriage should remain between a man and a woman. But apart from that, everyone here should have the same rights, the same respect, and the same recourse if these rights are not observed. Thank you. Well, that concludes the question time for this forum. When we return after these short messages, we'll be receiving the closing statements by each of our candidates. Please stay tuned. Seven Mile Beach Resort and Spa. It's fresh, fresh from the garden, it's fresh. Fresh from the baker, it's fresh. Fresh from the fisherman, always at her. It's fresh, fresh from the butcher, it's fresh. Fresh from the deli, it's fresh. Fresh from the summer rain. Always at Hurley's. At Hurley's, everything is fresh, and we mean everything.
Waste Carriers is your complete waste management company. We service commercial, residential, and construction properties. With our large inventory of dumpsters and grapple truck services, we provide an unmatched, dependable service. Our sister company, Island Recycling, buys and collects recyclables such as AC units, aluminum cans, auto batteries, copper, and much, much more. For Cayman's Waste and Recycling Solution, one call takes care of it all. Call 946-DUMP. That's 946-3867. Remove the stem of the strawberries. Dice and place into a mixing bowl. Split the jalapenos in half, remove the seeds and dice. Dice the onions. Finally chop the parsley and mint. In a small saute pan, reduce three tablespoons of balsamic vinegar until it becomes thick and syrupy. Thinly slice the French bread, brush with olive oil, and season with salt and pepper. Lightly toast the crostini, sprinkle with cheese, and toast until golden brown. Serve cold bruschetta on the crostini, sprinkle with cheese, and drizzle with the reduced balsamic. Enjoy! Welcome back to the First Baptist Church, where we have the Georgetown East candidates. We've concluded the questions, question time. Now it's over to the candidates for a two minute closing statement and we'll begin as they're seated. And we'll begin with Ms. Ms. Sharon Rolston. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Will, and thank you to the chamber for hosting this debate. Thank you to the sponsors. Thank you to the, my fellow candidates. It's been a spirited debate. Thank you to the audience, you, those of you here and those of you who are watching from home. I think it's wonderful that you are trying to be informed as to who you will vote for in this election. This is a historical election. And there's a lot of misinformation batting about that an independent candidate or the independent candidates cannot form a government. That is true of the parties. Neither party has sufficient numbers to form a government. And so there will be a coalition government, whatever the outcome. And so when you go to vote, vote for the candidate that best represents your interests, whether that person is a party candidate or an independent, because that person will form a coalition government. And you need to ensure that your, your interests are represented, represented, represented in the candidate that you choose to vote for on May 24th. As I said at the outset, I entered this race for one reason, and one reason only, and it is for our children, because I believe that they have been forgotten. They are the voiceless ones, and I want to provide a voice for them in our parliament. I hope that you will share that view and that you will vote for me, number three, Sharon Rollstone, on May 24th, so that our children have every opportunity to pursue their dreams and their aspirations. I want to be their hope. Thank you. Theresa Baden. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Paul. Thanks to everyone who came out to support us, to those who are watching and to those who are listening. Um, I'd like a special thanks to my team who are there. Um, this is a very important election. I represent the Cayman Democratic Party um, and it is, we've worked very hard for the last four years looking at every aspect of life here, seeing what needed to be done, formulating plans that we can begin to put into effect as soon as we're elected if we manage to take the government, even with a coalition, and I'm very, um, I'm very thankful for all the help that I have got and that we have got. I'd like to just say that for those who have problems in the communities that we cannot help right now, 
We will be coming back, we will be looking for you, and we will be taking care of you. Even if I'm not elected, I will still be in Georgetown East. I will be there helping. Um, education, business, the environment, our social programs, they all need a team to put them in place, to help them, to correct them. And I hope that if you, I hope that you will make me a part of the team and I promise I will do my best to fulfill my promises to you. Thank you. Mr. Roy McTaggart. Thank you, Will and Paul, for the job well done as our moderators. My fellow Caymanians, I, re I am proud tonight of the fact that I have been part of a government that has accomplished so much for its people in its first term in office. We have delivered on our promises and commitments, and we have clearly demonstrated that we are a government that gets things done. For me, I retired from public, a successful career in public accounting to enter the pursue of public office. In 2013, I was elected as an independent, but once elected, I quickly realized that even though I had the distinction of being the second elected member for Georgetown, I had absolutely no political influence or leverage. I had no intention then of leaving the private sector only to stand proud but idle, thereby wasting an opportunity to serve my country. I ran to serve, and if I could serve my government better by joining the government, then it was the right thing for me to do. I believe that time has proven my decision to be the right one. I didn't need a job then. I don't need a job now. I'm here to serve. In the past four years, I have served simultaneously as a councillor to four ministries and serving three ministers. I have acted for those ministers on numerous occasions, sometimes collectively for them while they were away. In addition, I also exercised oversight over the health and culture ministry on behalf of the Premier. And I have to say, it has been one of the most profound experiences of my life that I have found it most satisfying and gratifying. Tonight, I'm seeking re-election for two reasons. One, the work of the, of the government remains unfinished. I said before, there is much that we would have liked to have done, but several things and time did not allow it to, to be done. We have much to do. And then secondly, I believe that I have much more that I can contribute to a second term in government. And ladies and gentlemen, I am ready for higher service. And that is why on election day, I'm asking you, the voters of Georgetown East, to elect me, Roy McTaggart, as your representative. And to the wider Cayman Islands, I urge you, please vote for the progressives. Thank you. Mr. Kenrick Webster. Thank you. Paul and Will, it has been a great pleasure for you hosting the Chamber of Commerce, hosting this event. And to the listening audience and for those who are in attendance, thank you all so very much and for being so patient. It comes a time that one must realize that when they're going to apply for something, they have to pray to Almighty God for that. And this journey is something that I have done and I've prayed about it at length. Being a God-fearing individual and also serving our community with the youth and the elder over the many, many years, this was, this was not something that I had decided on, but because at heart, I have the Cayman Islands people at heart, I decided to do what I have been doing best within the community. I have impacted many, many lives, especially those that have bereaved families by providing free transportation to many across these Cayman Islands. By my bio, it shows that I have served the Cayman Islands as a detective constable in the Royal Cayman Islands Police Force for a decade. During that time, I was commended by the then Commissioner of Police, Mr. Alan Radcliffe, for detection of the first Cayman Bank robbery that held here in the Cayman Islands. I was also assigned to the attachment of the largest prison breakout within the Cayman Islands. 
assigned with the Metro Dade Police K-9 Division on the apprehension of those felons. So it shows that I have the ability to serve the people of these Cayman Islands. The impact that I have done is tremendous. I want to continue this work and I am asking and appealing to all of the people of Georgetown East to give me that opportunity because I have the ability, I have the voice to be that voice for you, the people of Georgetown East. And if you give me that opportunity, I will serve you like how I've served you before, and I will serve not only Georgetown East, but I will serve the entire three Cayman Islands. Thank you. Thank you very much. Turn it over to Paul Biles for some closing remarks. Thanks, Will. On behalf of the Chamber Council, I'd like to extend a special thanks to all the candidates for participating in tonight's forum and to the audience uh, especially who have taken the time to attend as well as to submit uh, some very good questions. We hope that the voters here this evening and those watching at home feel more informed about the positions of these candidates in the Georgetown East. I'd like to thank Hurley's Media for broadcasting tonight's forum live to the Cayman Islands public via Cayman 27. And I would also like to thank other supporting sponsors, namely the DART organization, Deloitte, Foster's IGA, Heritage Holdings, and Puritan Cleaners. The next candidates forum will take place tomorrow at the Arts and Recreation Center in Cayman Bay. This will be the Georgetown North uh, Forum. Candidates will include Mr. Joseph Hugh and Ms. Karen Thompson. Remember to visit caymanchamber.ky for news on the elections and our forums. You can find voting and voter ID collection locations on our website as well. Thank you for supporting the Chamber of Commerce candidate forums and have a good night. Waste Carriers is your complete waste management company. We service commercial, residential, and construction properties. With our large inventory,